Good morning, students. Welcome to another Mr. Cuban lecture. Today, I'm going to talk about electronegativity. And we're going to use our old friend Coulomb's law to talk about electronegativity. All right, and I've talked about ionization energy before, and I'm going to tell you now, ionization energy and electronegativity are directly related to each other, okay? Higher ionization energy, higher electronegativity. I'm talking about the first ionization energy, right? For each pr progressive electron, there's another new ionization energy, okay? Um, and electronegativity is, and this is where the, the definition is actually kind of goofy. It's one of those things that oh, everybody's got to memorize electronegativity. You got to memorize, but it's actually like it's it's the tendency, the tendency of an atom to attract electrons. And when you learn electronegativity, most of you will have a table. Okay, whatever book you're using, this is the, the, the British Corrupt VC Science textbook. It's, it's all right for Chem 11. They do a good job. On the back, they've got electronegativity values written down. Okay, and if I were to switch to the AP Chemistry textbook, which should, so there's one of them over here, they also have values in the book somewhere. Now, it's important to remember, you will actually get different values for electronegativity. The standard ones that most people use are the Pauling values, okay? And they're numbers that were, to a certain extent, I don't want to say they were arbitrarily assigned to numbers, but think about like a thermometer. Think about Fahrenheit, all right? He took his body temperature, said it was 100. He boiled water, said it was 200. That's kind of what Pauling did, a little bit more precise than that, when he came up with electronegativity values. So fluorine is the king of electronegativity. Why? Because fluorine only has two shells. So it's got one, it's got two. So it's got two electrons in the first shell, and there's nine protons here. Okay, there's nine protons little. I don't know if you can see that's a nine. There's two electrons there, and then there's seven electrons on the other side. So the shielding effect, the amount that these electrons shield those electrons from the nucleus is very small, and there's only two shells. So the radius is really small. So we have a high Z, right? Remember, Z is going to equal nine minus two, which equals seven. That's basically as high as you can go. You get eight, the, the noble gases might be considered as having eight, okay? And it's got a really small radius because these protons and electrons get pulled in to each other. All right. So when you talk about electronegativity, it's not actually that complicated. It's basically just the relationship between the radius and the effective nuclear charge Z based on Coulomb's law. And a guy named Pauling came up with some numbers for it. And what these numbers tell you, and this is where you actually have to be careful because textbooks have different values for this. This is what's weird about it. Some textbooks will tell you that if the electronegativity difference, let's say carbon and hydrogen are bonded, all right? And we, we all agree that carbon and hydrogen, which form the basis of organic life on Earth, have a very small electronegativity difference. Carbon is usually 2.5, and hydrogen is around 2.1. And so what we say is that if the electronegativity difference, the difference between these two atoms, is between 0 and 0 0.4, the bond is going to be non-polar. So I want you to picture you have a friend, and your friend is the same size as you, same width, same height, they run about the same speed as you, and you decide to play basketball, and you have the same skill level. That's kind of what this is like. They're playing basketball with these electrons, and they have the same skill level, so half the time one of them is winning, and half the other one's winning, and they kind of want to share these electrons equally. So this is called a non-polar bond. Okay, because the electrons are being shared. And, and covalent bonds, hopefully at this point in your, your chemistry career, you understand that this is a covalent bond, and it's co, as in co-ed, because they work together like a co-op, and they're valent because the valence electrons are the ones that are shared. Which if you think about it, you look at this picture, it makes sense. These seven electrons outside, they can be shared. These electrons inside, they can't. All right, so this is non -bold. And then... We're going to get to the slightly different bond. Okay, so now if I were to draw water. Okay, water here is here with oxygen, and there's hydrogen down below. Okay. Wa oxygen has an electronegativity, depending on the book you look at or the table, like at about 3.5. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. 
This is you when you're 10 years old trying to play against your 16-year-old brother in basketball. And what happens here is basically he takes the basket and he shoots it whenever he wants. Occasionally he'll give you the, the basketball back and you go in and score. And so this bond ends up being polar. Now, hydrogen, as your 10-year-old self, you're still good enough where you get the ball and you run around the court and your brother will be like, no, you're cheating, and he'll take it back for you. But there's still some sharing going on. That being said, oxygen has these lone pairs up here, okay? And these electrons typically stay on oxygen. And this is where you get this crazy Greek letter, and it's delta, it's a little d for, for partially negative, okay? I think I got the Greek letter right in there. Chemistry, we're not really great with Greek letters. It's more of a physics thing. Now, hydrogen, in this case, is going to end up being partially positive. So what happens here is you have a positive side, and you have a negative side, and they stick. So if you have two water molecules next to each other, they actually line up. Actually, I should line them up like this so that it makes more sense. So that the negative side and the positive side stick to each other. And that is the basis of a lot of life on Earth, actually, is the fact that the positive side and the negative side are But if the charges end up being the same, they repel each other. And this is why water actually lines up and why, if you're really careful, I've only ever done it once. You take a paper clip, you can put it on water, and it'll sit there. That's because you want to put these hydrogen bonds. All right. And this bond, you'll notice this is nonpolar because there's no pole. There's no north side. There's no south side. This bond is called a... Pole, oh, sorry, I should put the numbers on there. This is a polar bond. Okay. And it's actually from 0 0.5. And this is where textbooks get a little funny with things because towards the extreme end of this, to about 1.9, anywhere between 1.7 and 2.1 is kind of a debate whether it's a covalent bond or an ionic bond. All right, this comes into factor later if we're talking about Lewis acids and what aluminum does. But for now, we're just going to say 1.9 is a polar covalent bond. Okay, so it's a polar covalent bond because the electrons are still being shared, just not evenly. And now what we've done before is with fluorine and any of the alkali metals, any of the alkali earth metals, any of the group 1 or group 2 elements. Um, okay, and let's say, so I'm so end up here, so let's say I have sodium which has one electron, and then I have fluorine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This electron goes there, and so sodium gains a full positive charge. This isn't this Greek letter delta partial positive charge or partial negative charge. Full positive, and fluorine gets a full negative charge. And this bond is called ionic, okay? And it's because it's an ion, and ik is the, when you turn a word into an adjective. So these are ions, so it's an ionic bond. Okay, so electronegativity isn't terribly complicated. It's a big term, and people get confused because it's not based on something that you yourself will ever measure in a laboratory. It's based off of work that a really smart guy, Linus Balling, for the most part, other people have come up with their own numbers, came up with this, he's, he did a bunch of stuff with electron orbitals, um, came up with it in a laboratory based on his measurements. And it's, it's brilliant work, and they're much easier numbers. And if you put into a formula like the 0 0.1, 0 0.5 to 1.9, and ionic bond is anything greater than 1.9, okay, for now. Sometimes it might be 2.1, depending on what, you, what you've seen in different textbooks. And there are special cases, okay? So I just want you to remember that for now, don't overthink electronegativity. Just know that nonpolar, polar, ionic. Okay, and now notice I said this bond is polar. I didn't say the molecule is polar. But that's for a later lecture when I talk about Lewis structures and their polarity. All right, so keep in mind I didn't talk about the shape and being a polar molecule. I talked about the bond itself being polar. All right, um, if you guys have any questions, please leave it in the comments below. Uh, thank you for watching this Mr. Cuban lecture and have a good day.